There's lots of opportunity to have a much better lifestyle here than you could in the UK. Meet Jamie. Originally from the UK, he moved to Delhi almost three years ago. Jamie told me how living in India made him handle any level of spicy food, whether he's faced any prejudices for being British here, and what the biggest misconceptions our Westerners have about India. I'm Max, an entrepreneur and YouTuber based in Singapore. Let's dive in. Is there any misconception about India and the West? Loads, loads. One of the worst things that was ever produced about India, even though it wasn't a description about India and Indian culture, was uh, Slumdog millionaire the film so that painted India and it just amplified the stereotype people are poor they live on the streets they rob they steal all that kind of stuff but actually that happens in every society across the world that isn't just in India and actually the food here is amazing the people are amazing there are some stunning places to go and visit here I've been to Aurangabad which is about 45 minutes an hour that's probably wrong outside of Mumbai and the caves that were built that humongous caves I've never seen anything quite like it I didn't even know it existed until I got to India and lots of people in India were like oh <laughs> you went there so there there's lots to see here uh, and experience and lots of people say oh you're either rich or poor in India and I'm like you know, that isn't even you know there's multitudes of level of society here mm. much the same as there is elsewhere in the world and that kind of stereotype that you're either rich or poor it couldn't be further from the truth education is so important here because there's so many people here mm. so families will push the kids quite heavily <clears throat> to making sure they're getting good grades like the top grades you know they rank your class performance in the newspaper oh that's how aggressive it can be because you're challenging against you know 1.4 billion people here and the universities only have so many places and there are only so many good universities and they want to send their kids to like study in the states and in canada they need to get top top marks so there's a big pressure from that perspective but yeah i think people can assume from any kind of meteoric rise mm. uh, definitely have you ever felt this resentment towards you because you're like from Britain and it's like colony. I think there's a way. I mean, there definitely, there's definitely, I've had experiences where people have been kind of a bit brutal about things I may have, you know, I may post something about me going back to the UK or something. And then people like, will then say something. If things happening in the, in the news, people might post stuff about Britain and the history. Most of the time when people talk about it, it's banter. And you know, I wasn't here then, it wasn't me that did anything. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, all, that's all my defense is. The only thing I would yeah. say is I'm here now and I'm helping to contribute uh, to the economy and the country's amazing and I'm living here. So it can't be that bad. Was it easy for you as a native English speaker, like to understand locals, like how they speak English? Yeah, I think I'm better at understanding locals and drivers and people that come to the house and stuff i think people struggle to understand me and that is a big big problem and i've had that problem a little bit more since i've moved to mumbai i try and slow down but i naturally don't talk that slowly i tend to speak quite quickly so i'm finding myself having to slow down quite a lot and kind of use less not complicated but less colonial you know, colloquial words and stuff mm. don't use those words uh, and just simplify everything i'm trying to say and my accent some people go your accent so difficult to understand and other people are like, oh no, your accent's fine. So I try to learn Hindi, but it is difficult to learn. The sentence construction is different to the UK. The way that sentence is constructed is, very, is complete opposite to the UK. And therefore, when you're trying to speak Hindi, you, my brain is trying to rework which way around to say the sentence. It's very difficult. And therefore, when, they, when the locals will say English, they're doing it in the same way as they speak Hindi. Mm. And therefore, when it comes out, it seems like the sentence is backwards, but it's, that's the way they speak in Hindi. So that, that's fine, but you, you kind of get the drift. But you do, I end up, kind of also like when I write emails and stuff I'm using the same kind of grammar in my emails mm. so I make it easier for people to understand and mm. also it just happens like you do just end up merging into the environment that you live in mm. and you hear people talk like that that's how people that's how you end up talking yourself what's the biggest difference like for you between like living in London living in Delhi I think the amount of food is a massive thing mm. in India everything revolves around food they say that food changes every 10 kilometers and dialect changes every mm. 20 kilometers, which is definitely true having traveled a bit. But yeah, the food is very different. I think, you know, I always liked spicy food when I, before I came here. Now I can take anything. My mm. spice level's gone through the roof. <laughs> when I go back to the UK, I struggle with food because it's so bland in comparison. Yeah. Um, so that's a, a big difference. What's your favorite food? Butter chicken would be if I was on a bad day. I was like, that's my go-to. Breakfast, even now, I would say, uh, masala dosa so and when I go back to the UK I'm a bit struggling for what to eat so I can't get a masala dosa yeah kind of get into it and then I've always had a sweet tooth and being in India you, there's lots of sweets everywhere here so yeah glub jam which is like Indian rice pudding 
uh, soaked in syrup, mm. soaked in loads of E numbers, uh, is awesome, but so bad for you. Is there actually like the big chance to have like diarrhea or stomach problems if you're not prepared for local food? I, so I think, yeah, so I think, touch wood, I've not had loads of problems, but I think it's not necessarily because of hygiene or anything like that as to why people end up with an That's what people stomach. say. Yeah, totally, this. totally. Yeah. I think it's the change of spice level. So mm. there's a lot of flavour that goes into foods, whereas in the UK, you are salt and pepper and that's about it. But yeah. in Indian food, there is a ton of herbs and spices that go into a food, and any one of those mm. can then knock your stomach out. And it's not to say the food hasn't been cooked. Like, some of the best food and some of the healthiest food is on the street because it's cooked to, you know, one inch of its life. It's mm. cooking and cooking and cooking. There's nothing wrong with it. I also think the humidity, that heat, can also have an impact. You know, if you get really, really hot and you're just continually hot, that can also have an impact. Mm. But, you know, in most restaurants, the restaurants are amazing. Hygiene, there's no problem with hygiene at all. You just need to be careful if you're gonna eat street food, which street food places you go. If you wanna eat street food, go to the place with the biggest queue. So don't go to a street yeah. food place if there's no one there. If there's yeah. loads of locals there, go there. Yeah. Some of the biggest business in India are street food sellers. They mm. make an absolute fortune. There is mm. a famous guy, I'm, I don't wanna say who he is, but there's a famous guy in South Delhi who runs a set of uh, a network of street food sellers. He has one of the biggest houses in South Delhi. Are there anything that you're still not used to living in India? So I think moving to Mumbai, traffic's bad. Traffic was bad in Delhi, but you kind of got used to it. Like if the journey was an hour, you'd know it'd be an hour and it yeah. would take an hour. Here, I've only been in Mumbai for like six weeks, but the traffic, even short distances, like two kilometers, can take you half an hour. And the kind mm. of like, Google Maps will just keep extending the time. And you're like, oh, this is taking absolutely ages. I had a moment two weeks ago where I just got out and walked because the cars just weren't moving. So the traffic is pretty bad here, I have to say. I think my biggest shock coming was the weather. Mm. Yes, it's hot, but how hot it gets and for how long. You know, I still get people when I go back to the UK, they say, oh, you haven't got a tan. Why haven't you tanned? It's like 40 degrees every day. Yeah, living in 40 degrees means that you want to escape from the sun. Yeah. You don't want to be sunbathing in it, so you know. So from like, especially in Delhi, where it's a lot hotter than Mumbai, April and May, between 12 and 6 o'clock, nobody really goes out. Mm. It gets 40 plus degrees. There were times when it almost hit 50. Uh, when it hits 50, they shut the airport because the tarmac can't, they can't guarantee the tarmac in the heat. And it's searingly hot. And that's what Delhi's kind of known for. But on the plus side, in the winter, it has a very, very nice winter. Well, for me, it does. For Lots of the locals, it was freezing for them. But for me, it was like 15 degrees. I was like, oh, this is beautiful. And, it, and you could just go out and walk around. One of the challenges when it's so hot is you can't go out. Like walking is always a little bit difficult in India. The pavements aren't really built for walking. Yeah. Um, and especially where I lived in, in Delhi, there wasn't a loads of places to go and walk. Uh, but because it's so hot, you don't walk. And when I used to live in London, you'd go out and walk around everywhere. You'd walk from place to place. And when yeah. it's so hot, you can't do that. So the winter, made it possible to then go out and explore uh, India. In the UK, you basically walk or you cycle also? Yeah, I mean, people, people don't, cycle, don't, don't cycle, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but here you would be, it'd be yeah. dangerous to cycle you'd on the be, roads. Yeah, yeah. You'd, be, you'd be killed <laughs> on the yeah. road, probably, yeah. Well, what's the three best things for you about living in Delhi? The social part of it is amazing. Like, there's a restaurant opening up every day, there's bars opening up, there's a party everywhere. So the social aspect, the ability to play Sport is actually quite good. I played cricket. Mm. There's lots of cricket pitches in Delhi, so that's pretty cool. And then the food. You can get any kind of cuisine you want in Delhi. It's kind of the food, I'd say, pretty big for food. I think here from an expat perspective, living here that's different to the UK, like the expat world is very welcoming. Mm. And I think wherever you go, like Delhi and Mumbai are the two places I've only ever lived. Everyone's very welcoming. Everyone wants to know your story, where have you come from, why are you in India, what are you doing? should we go out for a drink on Saturday? Mm. And that's kind of a far more social world. I think the UK, not to say anything disparaging about the UK, but people have their lives, they have their network, and that's it. When I first moved here, I wanted England were playing cricket in India, and I wanted to go and watch the cricket. So I messaged the Instagram Barmy Army fan page. They told me of a guy that was living in India and living in Delhi. So I messaged him. He was like, oh yeah, here's the WhatsApp group for tickets. Are you now living here? I was like, yeah. He was like, oh, I run an expat cricket club. Do you want to do you play cricket? And I was like, yeah, I played cricket like 20 years ago. So yeah, I can play-ish. He said, well, I'm having a party for my birthday on Saturday. Do you want to come along and meet the guys? So I was like, oh God, yeah, okay, fine. So at 40 years of age, I went to a birthday party with a crate of beer, not knowing a soul. 
<laughs> and that was kind of like the first thing that led me to like a network in India. And that was really cool. And it's one of the things I always say to people now that they come and live here and just expats generally is the first six months you arrive, say yes to every single invitation you get, mm. which I'm sure you need to do. You know, don't say no. And, you know, 60% of them, 70% of them might be absolute rubbish. But, you, you know, you don't necessarily need that many people in your life. Anyone, well, I certainly don't. And you might find a network. And that was one of, the, one of the big things that I did very early on and then opened up the mm. network in India. In Singapore, there is this problem kind of that you start feeling after you've been in the country for like three, four, five years. Some people there for assignment. So you make friends with someone and then after three years, he's gone yeah. to another place or back home. True. And then you're like, okay, why well, no, invested so much time and never like making friends? So I definitely agree with that. So I had that probably, so I was, the first two years I was in Delhi, it was kind of post COVID. So people hadn't really moved out and people were kind of still locked in Delhi, so to speak. And then slowly people started to move out. And yes, it is difficult because you make very close connections with people and then they go and then you have to start again. And sometimes you're like, oh, can I really be bothered? And certainly like moving to Mumbai, I was like, you know what, I could just fly back to Delhi. It's an hour and a half on a plane. I don't mm. really need to make a network here, but, but you do need to make a network yeah. wherever you go. But the cool thing about that is you now, I now have a network across the world. So I've got friends in Australia, Brazil, South Africa, parts of Europe that I didn't have before. So you've kind of built this network across the world. That's mm. pretty cool. That is a transient life and you have to get used to that. Yeah. People will come and go. But the good thing is people are always still coming. Sometimes that's the case in Singapore. Sometimes, not always. Like foreigners stick together and like locals stick together. I don't necessarily think it's classified by whether you're an expat or you're local. I think it's about what you like, what your interests are. Do I have anything in common with you? Do I want to go out and have a drink with you? Can we chat about anything? And if you can't, then you don't socialize yeah. and therefore you don't mix. And that's why I think the groups just, if you've only ever lived in India and you haven't necessarily traveled that far, you don't expose yourself to kind of like Western culture, then it's difficult. It's going to be a bit, a bit harder for us to have a conversation and get into, because we don't really have that much in common, which is no different to, I think, if you lived in the UK and I was talking to somebody that didn't have anything in common with me, I wouldn't be yeah. a friend with them. But yeah, I mean, I think you do need expat friends in some ways. I had, a, when I first landed here, Three weeks in, the company got us like an uh, orientation guide and he would like tell you what India's like and stuff. And one of the things he said is you need expat friends because you're going to need that avenue where you can just talk about what happened in the football, mm. what's happening in the news back home. Can you see the terrible weather? Because you've got to talk about the weather because obviously we're British, got to talk about the weather <laughs> to somebody. You know, you just, you need that kind of release thing. Yeah, I think you just get along with people that you like or don't like. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily yeah. classify it as local or not local. Do you think you obtain any like new habits uh, living in India for two and a half years? You get used to some of the benefits of living in India. You know, I have a housekeeper. Most people have home help of some mm. kind. So when you come home at the end of the day, everything is done around the house and you haven't got to do that, which then gives you opportunity to do other mm. things. If you've got kids, then it's a godsend. Yeah. I heard it's a big, it's a big thing in India. Yeah, because everyone. So I yeah. think in all levels of society, no matter kind of where you are in the social structure, they will have some kind of home help, either if it's just somebody come in and clean, sweep, someone to do the dishes. Lots of Indian families, the mothers will still want to cook. Mm. So they still won't let, you know, I will let my housekeeper, she can cook. Lots of people won't let them cook and they want to cook themselves. So they'll maybe chop vegetables, do that kind of stuff, clean the dishes, clean the house, but they'll still cook. And it's all levels within India. I talked to my buddy, he's Singaporean. He became Singaporean recently, so oh, no. he's from India. I told him like, oh, Singapore is so nice because you have this domestic helper. Mm. <laughs> so life is much easier. So we never go back to Europe because there is no such an option. And he's like, oh, I thought it's like everywhere in the world like that. Because in India, we have like five helpers. When I was growing up, it was like five helpers. So I've got friends here and they've got kids two kids under like five and got two nannies made. They're not going back to the UK. What's the, let's say, overall typical foreigner monthly budget? Oh God. Something like that. <laughs> or, or, or the Someone's going to tell me I should save more money. <laughs> if you were to go out for dinner in India and you go to a very nice restaurant, you are, I would say you would struggle to pay more than 10 pounds for a main course. If you're paying more than 10 pounds for a main course, you would be raising your eyebrows at that. One of the best restaurants in India in Delhi, there's one just opening in Mumbai. Uh, Michelin, I think it's one Michelin star restaurant, does a seven course tasting menu for 49 pounds. <laughs> this is crazy. You wouldn't get like half of yeah. that. You'd get like two main courses in the UK, maybe for that. Michelin star, maybe. I know. In, so, Sing in Singapore, it would be 10 times actually. Oh, it would so be yes, 500 so, SGD. Yeah. Oh, um, like, okay, seven times. And then depending on where you live, so alcohol, I mean, I don't really drink that much anymore. PT, listen to that. But alcohol, depending on where you are, can be quite expensive. Anything that's imported generally is more expensive. So our wine, 
you'll pay 15, 12 to 15 pounds for a bottle of Jacob's Creek, mm. which many people would say that's 12 pounds, 15 pounds too much. But spirits can be a lot cheaper, especially like North India, mm. where I was, alcohol was relatively cheap. And in some cases, very, very cheap. As you mm. come further south, it tends to get a little bit more expensive. Certainly here, it's a lot more expensive than it was in Delhi. Your biggest bill in the house, apart from maybe rent, depending on whether you're paying rent or not, electricity, obviously ACs are on quite a lot of the time. Anywhere between maybe £100 to £120 in the peak months, depending on how much you put on, which is mm. way less than the UK <laughs> is now. What would be the price of, let's say, one bedroom apartment in a nice area in Mumbai or Delhi? One bedroom you could probably get in a kind of like expat area, would be maybe like 800 pounds a month, maybe slightly less than that, depending on the standards and stuff. But yeah, in Delhi, I used to live just outside Delhi, but you'd pay close to 2,000 pounds, but you'd be 4,000 square foot apartment, gym, restaurant, bar, salon, spa, two swimming pools, <laughs> lots of space. In yeah. Mumbai, you just, you just lose the space because it's so tight for space here. Uh, so you pay kind of similar money, but you'd be half the size. Do you think it's something that, let's say, UK can learn from India? A couple of things. Like, I think there's a view in the West that the East is trying to mimic the West, yeah? And in certain instances, that might be the case. But there are certain instances where the East, the East has the right thing going on and the West doesn't realise. From a cost perspective, there's a lot of people here, so things are a lot cheaper because people tend to be cheaper here. So there's lots of opportunity to have a much better lifestyle here than you could in the UK. I have a personal trainer, cost you know, the equivalent of 10 pounds an hour. You know, in the UK, that'd be 40, 50 pounds. Mm. You can have home help here. Um, I can get deliveries for shopping, groceries within 15 minutes. I don't have to book a slot. I don't have to be in. I don't have to spend a minimum of 50 pounds to get the booking, mm. to get the slot like a supermarket does in the UK. So there are certain things that are coming. There's some payment modules here. You know, in the UK, there is Apple Pay. Here there's Paytm, means I can pay a street seller with my card. That's awesome. So there, there's lots of things I think, small things that I think the West could learn. I also think the family is so important here. Lots of things revolve around the family and how important that is. Food, as I talked about, is an integral part of kind of like Indian culture. You talk about food and Britain and people kind of like, yeah, just can't, can't move on, move on. What is that? What is India? What is English food? So that's a big part of society and very, very important. And I think maybe the, maybe the West has kind of lost its view on where the family is and the dynamic of that. Let me show you some magic. If you click on this video, I will disappear and reappear again. Let's try it. Three, two, one.